Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Yes, we're over three quarters of the way through this book. No, it's not over. Yay? <laughs> uh, my Bedtime Book of Two Minute Stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's, tonight's, depending on when you're listening to this, stories are A Night in the Toy Shop by Margaret Connor and Kathy Postman by Rosemary Garland. A Night in the Toy Shop. All day long when boys and girls came in and out of the toy shop, the toys sat stiffly up on their shelves. But at night when the shop was closed, they all jumped down and had a jolly time dancing and playing all the games that toys and little girls and boys liked to play. One night, Jumbo Elephant said, Let's all dance! And he kicked up his legs and danced a jolly jig in the middle of the shop floor while the Italian boy doll played a mouth organ. Soon all the toys were joining him. The Swiss dolls joined hands with the French doll, who joined hands with the Dutch doll and the German doll. Kangaroo took hold of Teddy Bear, who took hold of Panda, who took hold of Susan with the golden earrings. Round and round they whirled while Puffin, Penguin, and the Yellow Duck danced a little dance all by themselves. The fairy doll waved her magic wand and all the balloons came floating down from the stick they'd been tied to in the corner. Rabbit wound up the clockwork mouse and he scuttled in and out among the dancers. Soon everyone was dancing, everyone excepting Monkey, and he as usual was getting up to mischief. He had found a bag of marbles and was sitting in a corner watching the dancers with an artful look in his eye. Suddenly, he tipped up the bag and let all the marbles roll across the floor. I'll fall down, he chuckled as the dancers began tripping over them. Down they fell, one after another, and Naughty Monkey laughed louder and louder. But he didn't laugh for long, because Guardsman Doll and Policeman Doll picked themselves up and came quickly across to him and seized him by the ears. Say you're sorry this minute or we'll put you up on the dusty shelf, said Policeman Doll. Monkey quickly said he was sorry. He didn't want to be put up on the dusty shelf, which was the highest shelf in the shop and close to the ceiling. Nobody would see him up there, and it was unlikely he'd be brought down again until the shopkeeper had a sale. Then he'd be brought down and marked half price. Monkey didn't fancy that at all. So he said he was very sorry and he'd pick up all the marbles, which he did, but he kept one. Look, said Rabbit, the sun is rising. It will soon be time to open the shop. Goodness, we must climb back up on our shelves, cried Jumbo Elephant. So all the toys and all the dolls climbed back up onto their shelves. And when the shopkeeper came and opened the door, there they were sitting up stiff and straight as though they'd never stirred all night. But as the shopkeeper walked towards his counter, a marble rolled across the floor. He didn't fall over it, though. He stopped and picked it up. I wonder where that came from, he said, and he slipped it in his pocket. Monkey grinned. He knew where it had come from. He had thrown it. It just seemed he couldn't help being a naughty monkey. Maybe he didn't really believe the toys would ever put him up on that dusty shelf. What a fun little story. I would like to point out that this was written several decades before Toy Story. Yeah, though it brought Toy Story to mind for me. And for those who don't know, I'd like to point out that a mouth organ is a harmonica. I was going to ask about that, because sometimes like that looks like a harmonica but mm, probably one of those cultural things and just look at this fabulous art it's so colorful and it's almost like some of the toys almost have like a different style like the boy playing in the harmonica kind of reminds me that of more of a japanese asian style of the way his eyes are drawn and everything but the others kind of look more european and stuff like that influenced so there's, I couldn't quite see the elephant because it was right in the fold. Why would I miss that little doll too? Kangaroo looks nice though. Everyone looks really happy and there's the fairy with the balloons. And this is the first time that the letters of the story actually overlap the artwork. Mm. The balloons go right out of the frame and underneath some of the story text. And in the very bottom Right hand corner is the naughty monkey. With the marbles. But there's a lot that was described because you have the Italian boy doll with the harmonica. You have the Swiss doll with the French doll. 
because you see them holding hands, but you don't see them right next to the Dutch doll and the German doll. We do have another doll off to the side, and then over here at the right you have Puffin, Penguin, and Duck all dancing together, just like it says in the story. You have Rabbit, you have the Clockwork Mouse. Then you have another illustration, everyone in the background with the shop owner picking up and looking at the marble. And everything's back in its place, and the monkey smiling. Kathy Postman. Every morning, Kathy went down the garden path on her tricycle and waited at the garden gate for the postman. She knew which way he would come because he always came exactly the same way every morning. He never changed. At number seven, the gate squeaked when the postman went in and again when he came out. At number nine, the dog barked and rushed out at the postman. He often passed old Mrs. Jones' door at number 11 because she didn't get letters every day. At number 13, the cat stood up and arched its back to welcome the postman. After that, it was Kathy's house. Number 15. Good morning, said the postman. Good morning, said Kathy. Four letters for your house today, he said. I guess you've got a visitor staying with you, haven't you? Yes, it's my auntie. How did you guess? asked Kathy. Because there's a letter for a Mrs. Baker at your house. That's my auntie's name, said Kathy. And she cycled ting-a-ling up the garden path just to let Mother know that she was coming in to breakfast. There's a letter for Auntie, said Kathy. May I take it up to her? We'll put it on her breakfast tray, said Mother. Auntie was pleased with the letter. I've won a little money in a newspaper competition, she said. Isn't that exciting? Will you spend it? asked Kathy. Oh, I will put it in the bank, said Auntie. I don't spend every bit of money as I get it. That would be silly, because I don't win competitions every day. Auntie went off to the shops all by herself and came back at lunchtime. She had a package. Did you go to the bank? asked Kathy. Yes, said Auntie, but I didn't put all the money in the bank. I bought a little something for the postman who brought my lucky letter this morning. Oh, what is it? asked Kathy. You may open it and see if you think the postman will like it, said Auntie. Kathy loved opening packages, even if they weren't for her. Inside was a postman's hat and a postman's jacket and trousers and a postman's bag. Oh, they are lovely, said Kathy, but they are much too small for him. He's a very big postman, you know. Never mind, said Auntie. Try them on. I see where this is going. Kathy tried them on and they fitted her. You may have them, said Auntie. Oh, Auntie, thank you, said Kathy. Well, what will you get for the postman instead? But you are the postman, aren't you? said Auntie. Every morning while I've been staying with you, I've been watching you from my bedroom window. I've seen you ride down to the gate and take the letters and bring them indoors. I heard you go ting-a-ling along the garden path, so I thought you were the postman. Yes, I am, said Kathy, and the next day she put on her postman's uniform and went on her tricycle to the gate. The postman was surprised when he saw her in uniform. My, you have become a real postman, he said. Next Christmas, when I'm really busy, you will have to come and help me. Kathy took the letters and went ting-a-ling back to the kitchen door, and she wore the uniform every day after that. Oh, that was cute. Yeah. Though, I'm trying to remember what I had. I had a bit of, not issue, but something about the story bugged me. Can't remember what it was. Oh well. Uh, well, the phrasing of it a little bit reminded me of Greedy Gobbler and checking my notes. Same author. Ah, the art's nice. The two tones again: bright orange and black. Very nice use of both, especially like it's almost like they used a sponge to get some of the texturing for the bushes and leaves in the background. It does kind of look that way. I do wonder how old Kathy is, though, because she's on a trike. Well, trikes can be fun. Also, that's a very old-fashioned trike. It took me a little bit to figure out if it was the perspective or a tricycle because of the way the back wheels are, and this one's kind of hidden by the color of the... It's defined more by her l shoe and lower leg being there rather than the wheel itself. But if you do recall, this is a very old book. Copyright 1969. Which you pointed out to me before. Thank you.
and I'm just kind of describing the style in case I don't use that particular image for the um, thumbnail, which I think I'm actually going to be using, because the other one's just kind of a street and mm. silhouettes. There's no real definition to it. But it's very descriptive, the row of houses. So, see, at number nine, the dog barked and rushed at the postman. There's the dog. Hmm, and I see the cat. He often passed Mrs. Jones at number 11, which is blank. Then at number 13, there's the cat. And then you get to number 15 with Kathy on her bike. Hmm. So it's actually the route. Yeah, it's possible. It's also more of a better shape for cropping for thumbnails. Yeah, because this is another angled image, the one where Kathy's on her tricycle, because... I would think to make it fit, you would kind of cut off the front gate and the grown-up watching. Eh, I would actually crop it right across the bottom because it has a nice shape of her face there. You see the hand of the postman, and you also get the background, which is most likely the ante. Yeah, so it would be an upper body shot, the postman's letter, and ante watching from the door, and you wouldn't see the trike. And you already know what I picked because you're watching this right now. <laughs> But you got a nice behind-the-scenes description of how we think about how to frame these. <laughs> and now on to the poem. Poems. Kites fly up in the sky. When the wind blows, away it goes. So hold the string tight with all your might, or you will lose your colorful kite. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, it's got a nice picture of a boy and a girl flying a kite. They're both looking up at it. The girl's sitting down, and the boy's... Enjoying trying to keep the kite from going away. It doesn't have a handle for it. He's just holding directly onto the string, and the rest of the string's balled up on the ground. I would have had it wrapped around my wrist. I would have had a handle if handles were a thing back when this was drawn. Mm. Another entry from my bedtime book of two-minute stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Tonight's stories were... Tonight... Because I was reading A Night in the Toy Shop. <laughs> uh, this entry stories were Night in the Toy Shop by Margaret Connor and Kathy Postman by Rosemary Garland. So, yeah, we've made it most of the way through the book. If you're just now coming across the two-minute bedtime story entries, there's a nice backlog and you can get caught up. They're not actually two minutes, as you can tell by this recording. You would have to read them rather quickly. I mean, we even timed the first ones. Yes. But if you're all caught up and you've already listened to all of those, there's stuff on the main channel. And if you've already listened to and watched all of that, first, thank you. And, uh, wow, that's a lot of hours to commit. Thank you. Yeah, we have, like, almost a hundred... 200 videos on the channel. It's a lot. <laughs> uh, and if you still haven't picked up a copy of this book and you've been following along, I think we still have a link. If this is your first exposure to the book, go check out the other entries. And if you want it, check out the link. Uh, just feel like shopping? Yeah, I know. It's a total non sequitur, but hey, Ebates link. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content in the Lux Analysis channel.